Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, everybody's having a good morning. So happy to see so many, so many of us uh, able to make it today. Uh, I'm, I'm Stephen Reichert and I'm honored to be joining this meeting from the, from the unceded uh, traditional territory of the Stohamish people. Uh, I live in Squamish and our office is in, um, is in Vancouver, uh, close to the Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. Uh, I see lots of people on the call uh, today who I know, but uh, there's also some folks here that I don't, I don't necessarily know. So just for, for their information, our team works in the area of research and evaluation across the traditional territories located in BC. Part of that includes extensive work in the area of healthcare evaluation. And we're involved in evaluating um, we have the opportunity to, to support decision-making and planning in areas of healthcare transformation um, through, the, through the primary care networks, mental health and addiction services, including our work uh, most recently with the evaluation of the provincial overdose emergency response. We also support a lot of localized responses such as the Moose, which is a local mobile outreach unit based in Campbell River. Um, it, it's an, an opportunity for physicians and mental health and other care providers to get on board a motor home uh, and travel to remoter areas in, the, in their region so that they can ensure that people are able to access uh, some of the services that they're really looking for. Now, our work takes us to pretty much every corner of the province and connects us with providers, administrators, frontline care providers, those who access care as well as those who are unable to access the care they need for, for whatever reason, including uh, you know, safe access or physical access. Um, through this work, we, we often see the extreme inequities that exist and some of those effects. Uh, and as, as a team of researchers, we felt we needed to do something. We needed to do something to help in, in any small way that from, you know, from where we're sitting in our space uh, that we can we can work to address the history of colonization and path, find a path forward through truth and reconciliation. So we're honored to be, be involved in putting together this webinar. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we start. Uh, I noticed Lisa, our facilitator was having, uh, as a result of all the heat, was having an unforeseen uh, power issue. <laughs> Uh, that we may have to address at some point in time, but, um, but for now we're okay. There will be an opportunity uh, for people to ask questions as in the last part of the webinar. I know it's hard to hold back when you have an idea, um, but uh, if you raise your hand, Lisa will from our team will, will get to you. Um, with Gracie's permission, uh, she has allowed us to, uh, to record today so that those folks who, uh, who wanted to be here but couldn't um, will have access to a recording of, of Gracie's teaching um, and will be, able to, uh, be able to access that. We are an evaluation firm, so you will be receiving an invite to take part in a short survey uh, at the end. Uh, it'll be sent out on Monday or Tuesday. And there will be an opportunity in that space for you to ask additional questions if we didn't get to you. And, and we'll be happy to get back to you and answer those questions. Uh, at the end of the webinar, also Lisa will, uh, will be identifying some resources for people to access. This is not an easy discussion. There are, there are some disturbing things that, that will be talked about today. And there are resources for you to access. Lisa will be posting those in the chat um, and we'll make them available uh, on the last slide of the presentation, which you will also have access to. And then um, and we'll also be hosting those on our website uh, along with the presentation and the recording so that you can access that. 
And just before Gracie begins, I, I really want to thank Gracie and the Chilliwack Division of Family Practice, as well as our own team here um, at Record and Associates for, for organizing this. It, it, it's a lot of work and, and these folk, we all really felt that this was not only timely, but needed um, and something that we could, we could all do. Uh, so I will pass it over to, to Gracie now. Peace, well, good day. Happy to be here to share on the unceded territory of the Chilean, the Tate, the Palalt, the Stalo, and the in the Catlip communities. Uh, my family roots are from Hachlip uh, Fountain Reserve out in Lillooet, BC, as well as Sawali out in beautiful Cultus Lake. Uh, so I'm also I'm very kind of honored to be able to share my perspective about uh, the, the truth and trauma and the impact of colonization. I've been fortunate to have worked uh, in field of education and health and wellness and also doing some instruction work and curriculum building. Uh, so this is um, very important to be able to have the opportunity uh, to share and build and grow uh, not only within ourselves, but within each other. Uh, so the title is Truth and Trauma, the Impact of Colonization. Uh, the world knows now and finally, after a couple of hundred years, Indigenous are being listened to. Uh, in their final slumber, the Wilkin Nation. Uh, so we you know, we're looking at the impact of the remains of the 215 uh, Indigenous children from Kamloops First Nations Residential School. Uh, thank you to Reichard and Associates for uh, being able to have the opportunity to do this work. There was lots of really great discussions in creating this opportunity. And um, I, I'm growing and building uh, my Indigenous work uh, with the connection of the services that are being offered here. So thank you for that. So traditionally, when we entered into a territory that was not ours, we'd ask permission to enter. With that welcome, it was important to share that we treated not only Sothtamuk, Mother Earth respectfully, also the people we talked to or worked with or played with. All of our work evolves around how we prepare throughout the seasons of the year, and that is Silalem. I ask at this time to ask uh, each and every one of you to acknowledge your traditional territory uh, that you are residing and are working on in the chat. It'd be really great to see um, the different territories that are acknowledged today. Uh, usually when I do the uh, traditional territory welcome, I, I identify health services. And today I identified health and wellness resources because I also look at this as kind of a prevention and or awareness. Uh, so that's why I added a couple of additional words in there. I acknowledge the traditional territories uh, because that was here before um, the creation of reserves. Uh, so it's really important to identify the traditional territories. Living trauma. It is, is it because I am an Indian, a young Indigenous, excited first day of school, six years of age, to an elementary teacher who decided to spank the girl in front of the class for standing up to change how she was sitting on the floor? This is just one example of many that will be shared today of the negative impact of colonization that has huge impact on our Indigenous peoples today and years to come. It is not Canadian history, it is living trauma. I am a hockey fan. I really enjoy connecting and watching uh, you know, a lot of the hockey and I'm happy, I was happy to see this quote uh, from uh, Carrie Price of the Montreal Canadiens. If you have not spent any time in a First Nations community and listened to their stories, then you have no right to pass judgment on them. 
racism is taught. Please be mindful of your opinions and think about how you came to your conclusions about our First Nations people. In this slide, we talk about uh, the importance of Indigenous voice, Indigenous rights, because we're all proud to be Indigenous. The Indian Act is still a document that's used today. I will talk about the 21 things about the Indian Act uh, that you may or may not have known. Number one, it talks about denied women status. Uh, I actually was a part of this for a brief time in my life uh, where I married a non-native man. I lost my status. Um, yes, I lost my Indigenous Native status. Uh, and then with Bill C-31, regain my status again. Um, so I remember having a letter uh, that was sent to me to say I was no longer Indigenous. And then after Bill C-31, a letter came from the federal government and said, congratulations, you are now Indigenous. And so it identified uh, the community that I came from and my status number. Um, so I, want, I just wanted to share that story. Uh, number two, it talks about how the Indian Act introduced the residential school. I added the era um, after residential school because it was a period of, you know, up to 125 years. I also acknowledged over the years that it is cultural genocide uh, and learning of the negative impact that it has created. Three is created reserves. I shared about the traditional territories and uh, after a period of time, um, they just became identified as reserves. I have family who has attended Kamloops Residential School, uh, where some of our family members' surnames were changed uh, because I didn't like the name, uh, and so we're given other European names. During this time of the Indian Act, uh, First Nations were restricted from leaving the reserve. Uh, there was a period of time where you'd actually have to get a permit um, to basically say you're allowed to leave the reserve. Uh, number six talks about the enforced enfranchisement, loss of status of any First Nations that attended university. Number seven could expropriate portions of reserves. Uh, if you go through history and look at the traditional territories and you look at the reserves now, you'll clearly see how uh, that has impacted how large and how small our reserves are now. The Indian Act could lease uncultivated lands. Uh, we pro prohibited political organizations, prohibited First Nations from soliciting for legal claims prohibited sales of alcohol, prohibited sales of guns and ammo, prohibited access to pool halls, imposed the ban council system. The ban council system still exists today. I am proud, however, to have worked with Shohamo First Nations who has family reps that are leading their community uh, and that way they're taking care of their family by identifying their role in their community. The band council elections is that it creates community conflict every two to three years. Uh, so that happens still in many Indigenous communities. Number 15, it talks about not being able to use the native language and also not being able to practice traditional teachings or wearing of cultural clothing. Number 18, it talks about how the Indian Act made cultural ceremonies illegal. Denied voting rights and created the permit system and created under British rule for the purpose of subjugating Aboriginal people. 
It's time to build awareness and take action. We need to stop calling these places residential schools. They were not schools, they were places of genocide and torture. Schools do not have or need graveyards. During the residential school era, there are 139 residential schools in Canada, 365 American Indian boarding schools in 29 states, a period of cultural genocide in Canadian history and a living trauma. 215 bodies found or discovered is not the terminology we Indigenous want to hear. Families have known all along. Survivors who have attended residential school have known. Do you notice the timeline on the monument is 1893 to 1977. That is, could have been uh, two to three generations. The count is now 687 young indigenous bodies found and still counting as more sites are being requested to be worked on. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the terminology that uh, the technology is used for this work. Kwasai, thank you, Jennifer Roberts, uh, Chiactal, and June Jimmy of Squayala. I joined to support the vigil to commemorate Kamloops Residential School. Uh, throughout the day, we we're requesting from the community to contribute pairs of shoes. And when we had 215 plus, I smudged the, with traditional medicines of sage and sweetgrass. We're honored that day to have survivors from the communities come and trade, pay tribute and also share stories, as well as some drumming and singing were shared. Uh, we have a wonderful Sawali elder who came uh, to join us and she shared that uh, she was grateful to hear the songs as it took away some of the hurt. The Indigenous around our communities throughout the Fraser Valley attended up to four residential schools and there were also in Indian day schools as well uh, that had similar work as the residential schools. I have no doubt more will be found. I have family members who attended Kamloops, Cranbrook, and Kokolitsa. But this particular situation with Kamloops, my family members had their suspicions that it was true, and there were burial sites there. There were areas that were forbidden to play in or be around. They had some sort of knowledge that they knew this was there. 125, up to 125 years, 150,000 plus Indigenous, uh, loss of identity, loss of family connections, traditional teachings, mass methods of testing, for example, sterilization. Physical abuse was most apparent in the stories from survivors and intergenerational survivors who have heard or not heard from their grandparents or parents who tended. From the early ages of age three, Indigenous children were taken away to bring the Indian out of the child. Some survivors sharing. One of the survivors who was in our community meeting the other night made it clear we don't want to use this tragic event as a means for revenge. We want to use it as a way to help one another to bring resolution to these outstanding issues. Some tried to escape to go home because they're missing their parents and their community. There was a lot of physical harm, usually was a form of punishment, resulted in hearing loss. You could be hit by using your left hand to write, as an example from a survivor. Another survivor shared how it was hard for her to sleep knowing that she might be taken away. Only the good food was for everyone else except us. And that's where I would like to have at this time uh, to um, have Peggy Janicki come on and just take a couple of minutes to share about the secret pocket. Peggy, if you're here. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, wonderful. Iswa Yasuo Kwasai, Kalakshin Talskui, Baiwa Talskualuo Kwas Ami. Hello. Uh, my English name is Peggy Janicki, and I go by the pronouns she and her. Uh, I'd like to raise my hands to um, 
to Gracie, but also the other workers, you know, that have that are able to create the space for us. So my hands uh, give thanks to all the workers. I'm always cognizant to, or try to be cognizant to, of um, how easy it can just push a button and I just magically am in this room. So um, I appreciate all of the work that's gone into, um, into creating this space. So uh, the secret pocket is a story. So uh, sorry, I wish to uh, self, uh, to self locate. Uh, which Dr. Maggie Kovac says honors the self in the collective and clarifies one's perspective on the world. Um, I am the Kalshne. I am Zamasu from Nak Asli Waten, uh, and I was born and raised in Stala territory. So my family is from Nak Asli Waten, which is Stewart Lake, um, at the mouth of the Stewart Lake. And uh, Nak Asli, what Tan Nak Asli means where the arrows once flew at the mouth of that beautiful Stewart Lake. And um, my mother moved down to Chilliwack uh, before I was born. And so um, have I, that's where my born and raised in Chilliwack um, uh, and, and continue to live in Chilliwack. And this story, so our connection to Kamloop, so uh, folks may or may not know, but La Jack Indian Residential School is uh, currently, um, or has been on the Fraser Lake in BC. And my mother attended uh, La Jack Indian Residential School. That school only went to, I think, grade six. Sorry, I've forgotten the grade. And then uh, from there, for the older grades, all of our children from Lajac would be uh, gathered up in the gravel trucks, uh, the open trucks, uh, uh, and sent to Kamloops Indian Residential School. So that school, uh, when that uh, confirmation of, of those children, uh, it was most definitely uh, has an impact on, on my family and my community. Uh, the story of the secret pocket comes from my mother. Uh, so along with many, many other uh, survivors, uh, they don't talk about their, they don't talk about their experience. They don't, they don't even tell their families, you know, so listening to Dr. Ray Silver Sr., if you know his story uh, from Samath First Nation, uh, he did not tell his family until much later in life, like I think in his 70s, maybe, um, told publicly we held a teacher gathering or a teacher honoring, and uh, he told his family that he had a brother, uh, and the whole family did not know. And so, you know, these this not telling is very common, and so um, the same was with my mother. Uh, she didn't talk about it. She didn't... Um, like not very much. And it wasn't until later in life that she the story just kind of popped out. She was at the Abbotsford uh, Rehabilitation Hospital. She had broken her hip um, and she was uh, giving the nurses a hard time that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you to the nurses in the room. Um, uh, but she she decided to talk about the secret pocket and what it is, in, in short, is speaking to the common, common theme of the poor, the poor conditions of those schools. Uh, and so the food was you would have mush in the morning, you would have a soup at lunch, which is either a gray soup or a soup with color, de depending on the season uh, and dinner time. Uh, sadly, was a continuation of that and may even, yeah, much as uh, hot oatmeal, my apologies. Um, and the, um, the dinner may, may even have, uh, because the school would keep the meat too long and in poor conditions, so is likely to uh, have, be full of maggots, right? So um, the conditions are heinous. They're ethically dubious, we, we know this. And so, but what I like to do about this story, so I've written, my mom told this story and she, what she was talking about was uh, she had a classmate who was holding her hand cut like this all day long. And of course, you know, you're not allowed to talk at school. She couldn't check in with her classmate till the end of the day. 
And it was like, you know, what is, go you know, why, what is this? Because it's the child, the child, her classmates holding her hand like this. And every once in a while, will sneak, you know, her finger to her mouth throughout the day. Well, she found out that her classmate was holding a tablespoon of peanut butter. Uh, they had stolen down to the kitchens, stole a tablespoon of peanut butter, um, and was eating it during the day. The older girls, along with my mother, are uh, would are are we're geniuses. Our families are geniuses. You know, we know how to sew. We know how to just create. We're artists. We're artists from the land. Uh, continuing our obligations, you know, to soft gemach, our obligations to the land, um, uh, you know, by being weavers, by being uh, bead, uh, working with moccasins, uh, bead work, all of those things. And so my mother, along with the other girls at Lejak, uh, they would, when they saw the rags in the rag box in the sewing room, they came up with the idea to sew a secret pocket in their petticoats. And so this is very much underground, you know, they're securing safety, they're securing food. And so um, I'm really cognizant to locate this story with around our own agency, right? So the, the, all of the laws that Gracie just shared, you have to really think about, contextualize within our families around how genius we are and how, you know, we're gonna go underground. You know, if we're not able to carry on with our laws, carry on with our indebtedness of our laws and our, I come from a clan system, so we wear button blankets. And so there are examples uh, within my family on how the ceremonies continue. And um, I would like to align that story with, um, with that spirit of agency and genius of our families. The, um, there is a children's book, so I am a teacher. I forgot to mention that part. I'm a teacher in the Mission School District, um, also on the Mission Teachers Union as, um, as the Indigenous Chair. I'm also on the BCTF Executive as member at large, uh, Indigenous, and so uh, looking after many, many things um, is there are uh, many resources uh, out online I quite love the, um, the Secret of the Dance is an amazing children's book to really talk about our agency and our counter narratives and how our ceremonies, you know, went underground, you know, to have a further uh, conversation on that. Sorry, Grace, you're going to have to stop me there or, or, or tell me when to stop because sure. I'll... Um, Thank you. Just, Thank you, Peggy. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I could tell you know there's so many resources. So uh thank you, Grayson. Okay, super. I'm I'm really happy you're able to join us today as it's really important to acknowledge the work uh within our communities. And yes, we're so fortunate to have uh Mary Sutherland also connect with the work of the Salish weaving as yes. we had um the Salish weavers uh the, the Sardis Ladies Club were part of the Salish mm -hmm. Weavers, which created opportunities um, for all of us to continue on with the traditional teachings mm -hmm. and the work of the uh, uh, of the work of the resources that we have. I'll go to the next slide now. Uh, the apology uh, by the government on in June 2008. <clears throat> um, there was the common experience payment was a lump sum payment that recognized the experience of living at an Indian residential school and its impact. All former students of a recognized Indian residential school that were alive on May 30th, 2005 were eligible for the CEP. Some were not able to complete the documents as they were not recognized as attending the school because maybe their names were not put in because their names have been changed. Uh, and the results of the CEP assisted with the development of the truth and reconciliation calls to action. The apology to the survivors and all the Indigenous Canadians um, 
you know, in June, I remember being there. I remember sharing the apology, the official apology with people. Uh, the survivors didn't want anything to do with the document. Um, there may be one person or two that maybe kept it. Um, others didn't want to have it um, with within their within their home, uh, they, they just basically, everyone said who were survivors that the apology was too late. Uh, here we have the picture of the uh, indigenous children that were picked up. Uh, it's just a story of how uh, students who attended the school, the children who attended the school, I wanted to identify my mother, uh, Marge Kelly of Sawali Haklop, uh, went to school from Fountain to Kamloops. Uh, when I was a teenager, um, she shared how the, uh, there was this cattle truck that drove beside us. And she said, I remember going to school in one of those and I couldn't really picture it. And then it wasn't until that long ago that I actually seen this picture and I go, okay, now I know uh, what my mom was talking about. Um, so there could be students or there could be indigenous um, children in here that are from our families. There were also some connections to uh, the Stalo communities where uh, people either had to catch the bus or get in this truck to go uh, all the way to Kamloops. Um, that was their method of picking people up uh, around the fall time, maybe, maybe returning for December, uh, but more, more often than not uh, coming back in the summertime and doing it all over again the following uh, fall time when school would start again. Uh, so the 60s scoop throughout the Fraser Valley, which we call home, Sothtamuk, there were survivors of residential schools and also survivors of the 60s scoop. There are also some who never returned. Um, I was very surprised growing up and learning uh, that, I knew, that I know a lot of people who are from the 60s scoop. Um, and that happened uh, for a long period of time. Um, this, this is about uh, how an Indian indigenous person was able to be purchased for a fee of $10. Uh, the adoption of us uh, was quite common. There are many stolen Indians, First Nations indigenous that were sent over overseas and out of country. Um, all indigenous children are subject to this and parents were told uh, that their children or child ran away. Um, it's just hard to believe that this happened and the advertisement um, just to basically take us away uh, from our families, our community, take us away from our identity. I wanted to identify some of the wonderful work that our Indigenous uh, communities have and I was thinking about the title of this uh, slide, Taking Action to Support Indigenous. Our Indigenous worldviews capture something that I'm proud to share um, and have developed with the connection with our Indigenous communities from Chilliwack to Boothroyd. Uh, before I came and while I first was, when I first started, uh, there was a connection of what does cultural safety and humility mean to you? From those wonderful engagement sessions uh, came the opportunity to identify the work for the cultural safety and humility framework and learning of what may be uh, seven caring or sorry seven sacred teachings says seven laws of life seven grandfather teachings thought it was appropriate to really identify indigenous know how to take care of our families taken care of communities uh, for thousands of years. And within that, I developed the seven caring teachings, uh, listening, supporting, sharing, trust, respect, helping and healing. Who would have thought that healing would be part of our culture? 
it is now more important than ever. We know how to take care of our Indigenous peoples. We've been taught by our ancestors and will continue on for future generations. That can never be taken away from us ever again. Here are some ways how we support the seven caring teachings. This is the some members of the Choeic and the Stalo communities, uh, our wonderful canoe teams who wanted to acknowledge uh, those survivor, those Indigenous children that were part of the Kamloops Residential School findings. Um, so they just went up and had this beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Um, come with us kids, it's time to go home. Uh, it will take years to identify those that have passed. And, you know, I truly am honored to have the opportunity to learn and share and grow uh, with all these wonderful activities that we do throughout the year that bring us balance and definitely the canoe um, the canoe season comes along and the powwow season it brings us all together it brings us to another family to network and provide opportunities to be with one another to belong it's so important I wanted to share as well uh, the wonderful work uh, Dr. Josh Gregan and Fraser Health and Cholock Division of Family Practice uh, who supported this work to provide what is, I called it, cultural reciprocity, uh, recognizing the gifted artists of Francis Horn Jr., uh, family connection to Yaka Kuyus and Yvette John from Chihuahua. Uh, Francis created this beautiful house post carving, and it is uh, one of the clinics, as well as Yvette John created these beautiful, beautiful Salish weavings that are also once again connected uh, to how we honor Mother, Mother Earth uh, for all its great resources. Uh, so it's really wonderful to see the opportunity um, that not only, you know, it brings that cultural presence, when our Indigenous enter into these uh, primary care or healthcare clinics, that there is that cultural presence. Um, it's so important to provide that opportunity of what is accessibility and uh, long term health and wellness supports. So I wanted to thank everybody who contributed to this work because it's so valuable. Uh, the, butterflies and stars and diamonds in the middle of the picture that also identifies the room space that we call the sacred space uh, at the Fraser Canyon Hospital. Really, really great to see this work. Uh, Bonnie Graham or Bonnie Wise, is a local Stala artist, created this design. And thank you, thank you, City of Chalawak, for acknowledging our territory, the Toyak territory. It identifies the communities on each of these paddles. I've been waiting for this for a long, long time um, to kind of see some kind of acknowledgement of who our communities are within our territories. It's so important to, uh, to identify because it also creates that sense of belonging for other uh, wonderful Indigenous people uh, to connect with our valuable teachings that we have. Kwasai, thank you again to the city of Chalawak. Uh, for removing the street name recognition of, Trot, of Joseph Tretch, who became the province's first lieutenant governor in 1871. Uh, Tretch's legacy was demeaning First Nations people, refusing to recognizing their rights and title, effectively displacing them from their traditional lands. Uh, thank you to those that reside on this street, and hopefully they'll be involved as well as some elders and some uh, Choeic uh, community reps for developing a new name. I was so grateful uh, to see this sign. And I remember uh, 
talking to Mayor Ken and I said, just a couple of tears of joy came out just recognizing uh, that this work was done because it's so important uh, to see that this, this be taken away um, from our community. I wanted to acknowledge uh, this wonderful work in the presentation today. Uh, Lilani Diablo is well known all over the world by uh, doing her wonderful powwow dancing and participating and sharing uh, the importance of our culture. And this is definitely one of her special gifts. Uh, so in paying tribute to her work uh, by acknowledging uh, this wonderful picture. Uh, so this picture was taken by uh, Fred Meyerink, who is also uh, taking the time to develop and share and learn and teach and provide uh, pictures into our new primary care health center. Uh, so one of the selections of his pictures will be in our new place, our new place on Evans Road, and it's called Mami y Estel Out, meaning helping one another. I'll just share uh, some wonderful words that Lilani had uh, in regards to this work. In a society that follows trends, I hope you continue to learn the struggles we face and unlearn the systematic racism that so-called Canada was built on. Not just when it's trending, we need to move forward together. We have many ways to tell our stories. Proud to be Stalo, Statmiak, and Kanaka, Malawi. And once again, recognizing uh, Fred Meyerink for his work. And I look forward to seeing uh, what pictures he selects uh, as they're put up in our new building. I also wanted to identify, we will be having a beautiful sacred space room to provide holistic teachings and sharings from our traditional wellness mentors. So thank you for the division and Fraser Health for having that uh, wonderful opportunity of providing cultural presence. So I wanted at this time to thank our non-Indigenous friends and families and for supporting their, uh, for their support and spreading awareness. I wanted to acknowledge that we see you, uh, we hear you, we appreciate you for standing with us, heal with us. I like to say those words, heal with us. I've been asked to kind of talk about, you know, what does Canada Day mean uh, to us for tomorrow's uh, usual celebration uh, to celebrate or not to celebrate for July 1st. I ask that you reflect on, on what we have to celebrate as Canadians. Our history and living trauma has to be acknowledged in light of the truth. We, lived have, we have lived alongside Canadians when they first set foot on these shores. We have been systematically silenced from the government, the churches and the legal system. They have tried to take our lives, our lands, our culture and our children. We have spoken out many times and our words fell on deaf ears until now. The discovery of 215 graves at the Kamloops Residential School was validation of what our ancestors and survivors have been saying all along. Now we hear of more graves at other residential school sites with larger numbers recently disclosed in, in Saskatchewan. July 1st, as Canadians celebrate this country that this is now called Canada. So I want you to think about how you'll be celebrating. I know some people are making a choice to wear orange. Uh, we as Indigenous are choosing not to celebrate that day. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, we have additional resources. I identified um, some of the resources that I shared. I also wanted to identify in the corner, we have Every Child Matters. Uh, this is the design from Bonnie Wise or Bonnie Graham of Stalo, uh, taking the time to acknowledge our Indigenous 
Davis um, for their design work and also connecting with uh, Phyllis's story online as she was the one who um, shared her story of how her orange shirt was taken away. Uh, so in recognizing her wonderful work and her presentations, uh, please check out her videos as um, they're so important to share um, from her story as being a survivor. So these sites, you know, I added the timeline of uh, Indian Residential Schools of Government of Canada. <laughs> I was kind of, I added it just for the sake of saying this is what's available. Um, I also identified uh, this wonderful website uh, with the Mission School District uh, that Peggy is connected with. A beautiful, beautiful website. Lots of really great and wonderful educational and uh, resources that are worth the time to check out. I really love checking out uh, CBC um information because they're able to kind of really come to terms with what is happening current uh, this is one that i just wanted to identify uh, this is time for healing communities need to heal from both wounds history and contemporary canadians need to help us heal and stop the harm and of course the uh, acknowledgement of the church sign as well uh, here we have support resources uh, that are available for survivors, for anybody who is seeking some support, as it's really important uh, just to identify at any time that you're feeling overwhelmed, um, you know, not to carry this with us, and especially our Indigenous, and that these support lines are here. I have connected with all of these services just to find out and learn and um, just to make sure and then that way in case I'm connecting, not in case, when I connect with survivors um, that I'm also familiar with how that process is. Uh, so this um, ends, ends my work uh, for the presentation today and uh, I'm, I'm welcome to turn it over to Lisa. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge at the end, I would just like to offer a drum song, but we'll leave that till the end. So I'll leave it to you, Lisa. Great. Thank you so much, Gracie, for, for sharing all of this with us today. Um, so I'm Lisa and I'm a research analyst at Reichert and Associates, and I'll be kind of facilitating the discussion. Um, so I know that that was a lot of, of ground to cover, a lot of difficult things. Um, to, to learn or, or to, to hear about. Um, so please, if you want to just take a moment um, for yourself and then come back to the conversation when you're ready, um, please feel free to do so. Um, so Gracie did share kind of that last slide of the, the supports that are available. So I will be posting those in the chat kind of at the end of our discussion. Um, so those are different resources um, that are available for you today to, to speak to someone if you feel like you would like some support. Um, and Gracie also um, has supports in, in place for herself as well, which has helped her to be able to kind of bring this information to us today um, and to help to navigate some of the discussion. So I just wanted to everyone to be aware of that as well. Um, so in terms of how to interact, um, so I'm hoping we can use that reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and that's where you can raise and lower your hand. Um, you can also post any questions um, in the chat box um, as well and so we'll be able to go through those. Um, as Stephen had mentioned kind of at the start, so we will be sending out a survey Kind of for feedback and also where you can post additional questions um, if we're not able to get through everything today. Um, and then we'll also have a landing page on our website. We'll be developing that. So that's where we can share some of the resources that, that Gracie shared um, and also put together a bit of a Q&A based on you know, questions that, that maybe we couldn't, we, we haven't answered yet. Um, I also just wanted to say before before we begin and open it up um, that this is really a safe space um, for learning, and I, I do we do want you to feel comfortable to engage with the information that, that Gracie has um, presented. I know speaking from from myself, my own background from you know settler and colonizer roots. Um, you know I don't always know how how to ask a question or or what to ask. Um, so I just I just ask the best that we can do is come at it from an approach of respect um, and just even acknowledge. You know, I don't know how to ask this question, or I don't know if I can. <laughs> so, so Gracie has has kind of welcomed this conversation today. Um, so that's kind of what I would suggest in terms of you know approaching these questions. Um, so yeah, just before we get started, um, 
I just want to ask Gracie, are you are you ready for us to start with some questions? Yep, I'm sure I'm. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and yeah, so yeah, and Catherine also mentioned that we will be sharing out a link with the presentation and the recording of, of today's discussion as well. Um, and also, if there are any questions that maybe someone doesn't feel comfortable asking the group directly, um, you can also do a direct message to me in the chat, um, and then I can present your question anonymously uh, as well. So those are some options. Um, all right, so I've just I'll open the floor floor for questions if someone wants to kind of raise their hand or post in the chat, um, and then we can get started. I guess just just starting just based on what Gracie has the the materials and, and kind of information that Gracie provided. Are there any clarifications kind of on those on those slides or what was presented that that you just kind of wanted to ask about? Great. Monica I see had her hand up as well. Monica McDonald. I'm I'm happy to go now, but I can wait if people have questions. Great. Please go ahead, Monica. Hi. Thank you so much. I apologize. I had to miss the first few minutes here today. Um, my name is Monica and I live in Squamish and um, I have a question about as a settler I guess or that is that is my ancestry you know going back centuries but I'm still I don't have any First Nations background in me um, when I hear or read or learn of, of some of the stories especially of late that are coming out in the news about Kamloops and other regions my first instinct is to reach out to um, people I know who have First Nations ancestry. And those are very few, I have to say, just based on the way I was raised and where I was raised. Um, but I feel like now I'm also at risk of doing further harm. So I'm afraid to ask the people I know these questions because I don't want to um, create more awkwardness for them. Is it the right thing to do when you hear of these stories in, in the media to reach out to your colleagues and to reach out to your your, your neighbors who perhaps are part of these communities or is it best to just leave them in their peace? That would be some great insight for me. Thanks, Monica. I also see from the chat as well, that's also another question as well, is how do we how do we support our Indigenous friends and neighbors during this time? Kind of what what is what is the right thing to do? Um, Gracie, I wonder if you have a comment for, um, for mm -hmm. Monica and also for Daphne in the chat. I, I can give you an example of like when we had the vigil set up and we had uh, many people come from all nations to come and just to pay tribute. And even if it's just knowing that people are aware and knowing that they have that acknowledgement, um, it definitely does help. I've been, <laughs> I've been shopping and I've had people break down because they would see that I'm Indigenous. Uh, so it's, you know, and, and it's just a matter of their time for being able to share. And it's really important uh, to do that work. And, um, and maybe even like, I, I see the importance of, of just basically sharing from your heart. Why not? You know, because we know and we we share from our heart and and uh, when we need a teaching that needs to be done, um, we don't necessarily have a script per se. Uh, you know, we want to share the teachings that that need to be done at that time. Uh, so so I thank you for the questions and I thank you for having the opportunity to just be honest and kind of say this is how I'm feeling. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Uh, so that that could be a way to do it, and um, it it is acceptable, uh, it is honorable, and and we appreciate that that these thoughts are being shared um, and are thought of. So thank you. Thanks, Gracie. Okay, I see that Jackie um, has the hand raised as well. Oh, we're not able to hear you. I don't know if you can try muting and unmuting again. Maybe you have something in the sound. Someone's headphones might be plugged into the computer and not in their ears. And Jackie, you can also post your question in the chat as well and I can, I can answer it from there. Mm -hmm.
I just wanted to share as well, you know, in connecting with our Indigenous friends, uh, Indigenous elders, um, just kind of sending that message on, on uh, uh, how they're doing or how they're feeling because after every announcement, we're triggered again and we need to take care of our elders. Uh, so that would be, uh, I'm an intergenerational survivor, meaning my parents attended residential school. So then I need to take care of them. So it's a matter of other people supporting each other and um, any kind of recognition of um, checking in is, is important. So I just wanted to share that too. Thanks, Gracie. Jackie, we're, we're still not able to hear, so I don't know if you want to post in the chat. Um, Gracie, hi, Gracie. Hi. Julia from the Central Okanagan um, Silix Nation. I was just really inspired by that artwork, uh, the different artwork, and sort of thinking about our spaces um, at KGH and our primary care clinics and um, just kind of wondering where do you even start with that with starting to bring in more artwork and culturally, you know, beautiful and safe places in the clinic setting. How do you approach artists? Um, what are some of the respectful practices around that? And um, yeah. Um, connecting with the communities and then they they would have some uh, wonderful gifted um, artists that they would know of and so that would be a good place um, bringing an offer into a community to kind of share this is uh, this is what we'd like to do because when we bring that tobacco offering or that gift offering we're, we're actually um, we're also having the opportunity to kind of say, uh, we want to bring some of your teachings into our world. So uh, doing the offering is just really, really important. Um, being connected to elders from the communities uh, is such a valuable, valuable resource uh, because once again, they are the knowledge keepers, um, the ancestors of you know, are sharing their teachings and they're able to identify what those teachings are. Uh, so having those traditional teachings also incorporated because then we wouldn't want to say, hang up something that maybe is not part of the territory. So it's those, that kind of work needs to be addressed as well. And also, um, you know, there's certain protocols uh, that we want to ensure of too, so. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, that when we talk about the survivors that attended school, there are also uh, people that were um, Indigenous that were Métis that attended as well and Inuit. So I, I didn't want to forget that um, because there's uh, people who live off reserve uh, that we want to acknowledge too. So we want to take care of them as well. And, you know, going on the lines of your request for artist work, uh, maybe it's also making that connection uh, to the Indigenous Urban Off Reserve as to what would they like to see um, being placed on in, in our rooms or in our uh, clinics to provide that cultural presence. Thank you, Gracie. Um, so I'll check in with, with Jackie again, and then we have two other raised hands and some other questions in the chat to go through. Um, but Jackie, did you want to try it again or? It's not working yet. No. Okay. Okay. So sorry. Um, yeah, if you do have a chance to kind of pop that question in the chat, then we can pick it up there as well. Um, so I will turn it to um, Angie. Um, we have your hand raised, Angie Mitchell. Hi, everybody. My name is Angie Mitchell. I live and work uh, in Spuzzum First Nation um, on the Nakutma Territory. And I've seen on um, social media um, a couple times now um, the word Aboriginal and Indigenous. I know, you know, we were called Indians 
and First Nations and Aboriginal and Indigenous now is apparently like the politically correct or proper um, term to use now. I just want to know what is the proper one? I, I don't mind being called First Nation and or Aboriginal, but some some like big groups that have the word Aboriginal in it. And I think some people are starting to be a little bit offended by Aboriginal because we're actually in Indigenous mean, and they broke it down to what Aboriginal means and what Indigenous means. So I don't, I hear lots of different people use lots of different terms and I just don't know. We're in an age right now where, um, you know, people are, you're not allowed to say Merry Christmas or you're supposed to say Happy Holidays. And there's like so many different things that, you know, are, the correct terms thank you awesome yes well andy good to see you uh yes i i believe in using the word indigenous uh because then that could capture all of our first nations uh, metis and inuit uh, also i believe some people use aboriginal and uh some some use first nations as well um so in the work that I in the work that I've been doing, I like to use the word indigenous because then we're not leaving anybody out. Uh, so that's that's the way that we do the work at the division. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gracie. Um, uh, so Anna, we'll go to you, and then I'll I'll move to some chat questions after this. Um, if you want to go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. I appreciate that. Um, I want to start by thanking you, Gracie, for sharing your story and allowing the vulnerability that you do within sharing your stories. I think it's very impactful. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate you being able to take the time with us. I do have a question. Um, <clears throat> I work in transition house with um, families and sometimes um, quite actually quite often I find that folks are really disconnected from their roots and their ancestry. I'm wondering if you could provide um, resources for families to get reconnected to their roots um, just because of sort of the way that things have played out in in history that folks sometimes don't know who their ancestors are or or um, you know where they belong. Um, so I'm looking for resources to help folks be able to get reconnected to their ancestral roots and their their original territories. I've been really fortunate to have uh, connections with uh, several partner agencies within the Chalawat territory as we um, had a name sharing of the Indigenous Welcome Center. Uh, for a Chalawak location, and that'll be offered to all Indigenous off-reserve, uh, providing supports and resources. So I think about the opportunities of our communities uh, to provide their own welcome center, and how do, how do we do that? So it's a matter of uh, connecting with reps from each of the communities, and kind of coming up some with some ways of a communication strategy and also the sharing of maybe some opportunities of some workshops and classes. And that's where we get to know each other, um, offering of some food and, you know, and um, maybe some fun cultural teachings because uh, that will really bring out some opportunities to share who we are, where we're from and who else would we like to meet and be around and connecting with the friendship centers as well. Um, so there, and also the education uh, departments have a lot of really great activities with their Aboriginal education uh, teachers and our leads. Uh, so it's connecting all of these resources together. Uh, so I look forward to uh, providing that work and providing maybe um, some monthly newsletters or some uh, even some special uh, discussions about resources. My, my goal at the end of July for my next cultural sharing series is to actually have a um, have it specifically on Indigenous resources. And another tab will be about like meeting places and things like that. So, and maybe it's also sharing um, some social media 
places where people are gathering, you know, maybe that'll become part of it as well. So I look forward to um, making our families bigger and stronger and networking is so important. Thank you, Gracie. Um, I also see that Angel in the chat has noted um, the First Nations Health Authority also has an entire network of traditional knowledge keepers and elders um, and suggesting to reach out to traditional wellness coordinator that might be available to you in your region. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just gonna go to some, some ch chat questions that I've received. So one, the first one is an anonymous one, um, wondering about, um, again, about you know the, the day that we have coming tomorrow, so Canada Day. Um, and asking kind of what would be an ideal move forward um, for Canada Day from an Indigenous person's point of view, in terms of how, how would we want to deal with this day kind of moving forward, not, not this just this year, this coming Thursday, um, but moving forward from, from this. It, it just doesn't feel right to celebrate is kind of what this person is expressing. I really like the idea um, that was shared about wearing orange instead of red. I really appreciate all the wonderful, wonderful resources that are out there because they're sharing current information. They're sharing their thoughts on on what's happening um, as more or more are being found. And I think it's just really important to build up our information base, build up our knowledge of where we're at and kind of coming to terms, how are we going to share that information? Um, not only maybe within our family on how they feel and, and promoting those values of caring uh, that I shared earlier, but also how, how are they going to learn and grow and build up on, on all of this information too? Um, because this is not going away, this is, um, this is something that we need to always ensure to keep top of um, checking in with all the like the local credible resources like CBC and everything too. And some of these indigenous um, health service agencies for sure will have some really great um, sharings as well. So it'll be uh, it'll be an opportune time to to once again heal with us and grow and over time we'll kind of learn how do we accept um, this work uh, it'd be a long time before that happens but it's it's networking and being with one another is most important right now great thank you gracie um, another question from the chat is from Susie asking, I'm wondering how First Nations people will be able to heal if an apology is not given by the church. Um, so I believe kind of this is in reference to the, the residential schools. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the question from Susie. I don't know if Susie, you wanted to expand on that at all. Um, but yeah, just your thoughts on that, Gracie. I've talked to a few people about that and um, uh, just like the apology back in June, 2008, that it was too late. Uh, some are believing that this needs this, no, almost everybody would like to have this apology happen. Uh, and at the same time, when or if it does, how will it help? Um, I don't, you know, it's, it's all about the grieving time, the the work that needs to happen to not only take care of those that we are lost, but to take care of the elders um, and the families. Uh, so it's it's a really tough answer because um, it affects people in a lot of different ways. Uh, so I believe locally kind of learning how the churches are and maybe, maybe that's the answer, um, knowing that they're there to support uh, and be aware and heal with us is, is another thing to think about. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, um, another question is about, um, I guess, kind of engagement with Indigenous communities in terms of uh, bringing an offering to it when you're engaging with an Indigenous community. Um, what would you say would be some appropriate, uh, an appropriate or appropriate offerings um, in that kind of context? I really like to use the tobacco offering uh, because then it's 
it's recognition of one of the four sacred medicines. So we have sage, sweetgrass, tobacco, and cedar. Um, and if there is like maybe uh, a traditional medicine in your area, uh, you're welcome to take some of that as well. Uh, it's connecting with making the time, not necessarily having a set agenda and being able to accomplish all the work in one, in one sitting. It may be just having the introductions of who you are, what you represent, and also what you would like to talk about. Uh, so it may be making that connection with an Indigenous community and then um, having it set up. And then when you meet that person or persons or that group of elders, maybe um, providing that offering. And, uh, you know, that then we want to make sure the work's done in a good way. Um, just think of it as if we go up to a to an admin or a band office and kind of say, I want to hear about this, um, you know, they or we would want to be able to do the work in a good way. So having that special space um, to do the work and the share because it's extremely important to us um, to have our work shared. And we want to make sure that's done in a good way as well. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Casey. Um, I also had kind of my own follow up on that. I know this is something that um, through our work, we've also kind of um, uh, encountered over the past year or so, but making these kinds of offerings virtually, is that also something that can be done? Or, or what do you think in the kind of Zoom, Zoom world that we're in right now, is there kind of other ways that, that we should be kind of approaching that? I, I believe in the opportunity of being honest to kind of say uh, we're now able to meet in person and this is one way that we're going to offer this traditional teaching and hopefully that this work is being acceptable, um, you know, and, and it just basically comes down from the heart and, you know, we, we can never go wrong with that. And so I believe um, in any way we can to do that offering and acknowledgement uh, because it's so important with what that teaching um, will be offered and how that will support you in the work that's that's moving forward. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Gracie. All right. So I'd invite um, yeah any other any other questions. You can raise your hand or post in the chat um, about yeah what Gracie presented to you today or any questions that you kind of have after based on this discussion that we're having so far, which has been fantastic. So thank you everyone so much for for your questions so far. Yeah, I guess any questions, you know, um, Gracie had presented kind of the Indian Act and those 21 things that you may not know or, or be surprised by. I was wondering if there's anything about those materials um, or what she kind of presented that that you had questions about. Oh, I also see so some other questions on a different topic coming in through the chat so we can take those. Um, instead, so I guess um, Jackie's asking about kind of the development of your cultural safety and humility framework. I'm wondering if Gracie, if you can take a few minutes to talk about that, how that was developed um, and share that with the group if, if you're able to. Uh, with the cultural safety and humility framework, it was providing the opportunity uh, for the community engagement sessions uh, where it was divided up into the regions. So we have three primary care network region areas. So it was connecting with each of those regions and health leads uh, and also inviting communities from each of those regions and asking questions of what does cultural safety and humility mean to you? Uh, what are our gaps and services that we need to identify to provide health and wellness supports? Uh, let's work on some challenging to ensure um, that this work doesn't continue and we need to um, do it all in a good way. So having these heartfelt discussions, the smaller focus groups are really important because in that way you give enough time uh, for people to share and have that building of trust 
and also uh, you're respecting their space as well. Um, you know, it's really important to always, always identify with the, and make the connections with the health reps on a regular basis and being consistent is very important uh, because there will be times where um, health services might go in one way, but the communities would request uh, more assistance at, at a certain time. Uh, like for example, having uh, more mental health and wellness uh, supports and counseling is really important. So with this framework, it was connecting with the communities, asking those questions, uh, reviewing kind of minutes. And also um, I'm very fortunate that I know all the communities. I know a lot of leads, so whether they might be health reps or um, leaders and asking them what would they like to see and uh, development of the framework with, with a few people on the working group. Um, being able to share what what do we want to accomplish? Well, first it's coming up with what are our Indigenous worldviews? And that is what I shared earlier about the seven caring teachings. And so from there, what do we what would we like to achieve within this framework? So it's connecting again with the communities. What would they like to see? Uh, so that could be one example is uh, when a new person is hired, the community is able to also share with their membership what that position is and how they're able to support it. And that way it's not just from a top-down approach that we're offering this position um, and here you go, here's the community you work with. Instead, it's coming up with that grassroots process to make that position successful and make it long-term and make this position uh, part of a family. Uh, because they'll be connected with community and it's really important to identify that. The framework also talks about the importance of kind of strategic planning as far as foundational training, uh, like for example, cultural safety and humility, uh, foundation training of Sanyas level one, or maybe some connections with other Fraser Health or um, health services that maybe offer orientation training uh, to assist when a new hire comes on uh, to make sure that they have that experience of working with Indigenous. I appreciate the health authority providing some foundation training of when uh, they came into communities to offer the COVID shot. Uh, so there's lots of great resources out there. It's just a matter of uh, working with all with it all consistently, uh, so we have that um, taking away that fear of not being uh, going to a hospital or going to a clinic to receive care is so important. I'm able to share the framework as well with Lisa, um, and she's able to also provide it in uh, as an additional document to the slide deck too. Thanks so much, Gracie, for expanding on that. Um, and yeah, so as she mentioned, we will be um, putting together kind of a landing page of, of the resources that we've, that we've spoken about today and including that, that framework as well. Um, I see another question in the chat, um, linking back to our, our conversation earlier about kind of offerings um, that would be appropriate. Um, so Bernice is asking, is there a certain type of tobacco um, that, is, that would be purchased for this kind of offering? I like to use the tobacco pouches and I put it in like a like a headband cloth or a medicine bag. Um, the traditional medicines uh, definitely would be more appropriate, but um, at this at this time we use, uh, you know, just the tobacco packages that you're able to buy. So that's what I use. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Gracie. Um, so some last questions are coming in. So we do we do want to wrap up by about 1230. So we'll just take, I guess, the last um, kind of two questions here. Um, and then you can continue to post questions in the chat and we will be following up on, on those as well, um, just in case we do run out of time um, today. Um, so we have two questions coming in around, around the Indian Act, um, asking, you know, can, is, should it be, should it be, Get, do we get rid of it? Um, why is it still being used? Why is it available? Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the Indian Act and that kind of um, the history of it and how it's 
yeah, still with us today. Yeah, this is the connection with the federal government, and um, I'm I'm very, you know, I, I'm not very happy about the fact that it's still used today, especially with our band council uh, elections that happen every two to three years. Um, there are still many restrictions that we have, and so what is the answer? You know, the severe, uh sovereign nations it's about um getting our political kind of leaders to uh, make some decisions along with the with our governments and ensuring that there is some um, uh there needs to be made a way to make it better and you know when i think about you know some governments are wishing that we had treaties and that's another area that is of concern. It might work for some communities to go this route. I am a firm 100% uh, non-believer that is that that is the answer as well. Um, so it's really taking the time to bring to our leaders or, and uh, as, as, as they connect with other need leaders throughout the nations. Um, what do we want to focus on? What do we want to ensure so we can make some good decisions for our future generations? Um, it's long and long uh, process and making some strategic plans um, usually takes a lot of time. And when these decisions are made, it's actually having to reteach new people that may be on board too, so that um, you know, just seems to be kind of like that vicious circle. I think the matriarchs are our leaders and um, connecting more with being able to identify what will work and bringing communities together and sharing these topics. Um, and I'm talking about the Indian Act, how it affects not only uh, education, but health and wellness, um, justice, uh, everything across the board on how we how we live and work and and so it's very apparent and um, it, it, there just needs to be some some development over time and maybe there's more of a connection with the truth and reconciliation the calls to action uh, you know in kind of supporting this work so um, I hope I look forward to uh, getting into kind of identifying how is that work affecting our Indigenous. Uh, so I hope down the road to to continue on with that work too. Okay, thank you, Gracie. Yeah, I know that's a big, a big topic to get into with only a few minutes left um, together today. Um, so I think I would kind of leave, leave the questions at that. I do see that Rhonda, you're just asking a bit more information about the activities related to Gracie's, um, the cultural safety and humility framework and those activities going on um, with the division. Um, so yes, we can also be sharing those yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk to, to Gracie about that in terms of what we can share. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, kind of close our discussion today, sharing some, some supports that are available to everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna post those in the chat and they were also in that, that last screen that um, Gracie had presented, um, but this way you can actually click on them. Um, and I've also left my my email there as well. Um, so that is anything kind of webinar related, I would be able to kind of assist you with that. Um, and we're hoping, yeah, I can be kind of um, gathering some questions for Gracie as well, rather than having everyone directly email her. Um, so that's kind of our plan, our plan with that. Um, and again, we will be in touch, you know, by, by email circulating kind of the feedback survey an opportunity to ask more questions and then information on where where you can find these resources um, that we've talked about today. Um, so I just wanted to turn it back um, to Gracie, if you had any kind of final final comments you wanted to make. And um, yeah, we're just so grateful for what you've shared today. I really believe in having the opportunity to share this work um, because it needs to be shared. And it's so important uh, to continue on with the teachings um, it's also a time to take care of our Indigenous peoples. It's also a time to be aware of what is living drama um, in, in our Canadian, or what we hear and see as Canadian 
And um, I always go back to our home and native land, uh, you know, so it's really important uh, to acknowledge that. Um, I wanted to kind of send uh, to end the session with a special song. I wanted to acknowledge all the um, Indigenous people that are on the call. Uh, please touch base, please connect, um, because I want to make sure everybody's um, in good spirits. I'll do a song uh, recognizing um, our Stalo peoples uh, by Tietlam Spath and our four special elders. Way away, away, oh, a look to Stalo Shwili. Stalo lives. Stalo Shuli Wayotha. Thank you, everybody, for your time today. Uh, I'm hopeful that everybody has a good day, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you so Thank much you so for much, that, Gracie. Gracie. Sorry, my screen got a little bit frozen there for a second, um, but uh, just wanted to share some support resources um, and invite Stephen to say any final words. I'm just uh, so thankful for Gracie, for for her openness, her willingness to share, uh, and for everybody attending, um, because it shows in the community you know, wanting to to do things differently. So thank you. I wanted to share that little girl in the very beginning. That was me. I was the one that little six-year-old girl. So uh, uh -huh. in essence, it just helped me learn to stay strong and stand strong to uh you know always call out and learn and share about what is what is wrong and being able to um, provide that space so that's what we need to do provide that space so i'm that little girl but turned into uh, somebody who'd be able to uh, take on those challenges and build up uh, and offer those those safe spaces to kind of share um, that this is what happened, but this is how we work with what happened. So it's really important to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Gracie. Bye. Thanks, Stefan. <laughs>